Thank you so much for sharing this time with us as we examine the book what the Bible says to the believer also known as the believers handbook we wanted to start a revival here in our Bible study so here's what I need you to do I need you to call text reach out on Facebook and Instagram to everyone you know and invite them to join us right here as Pastor Banks continues to equip us with all we need to live our best life. In my closing, please allow me to leave this thought with you. Yesterday, I thought of myself as being pretty clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today, I think of myself as wise, and I'm allowing the Lord to change me. You see, if you start with you, and if you start from where you are at this present time, changing the world is an exciting idea, but allowing the Lord to change you is what makes it all possible. Thank you so much, and be blessed. and peace be unto you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at the St. John Progressive 
Missionary Baptist Church. I'm your host, Reverend Bartholomew Banks, pastor of this fine church. We're so delighted that you've allowed us to be a part of your Wednesday night activity. We have enjoyed a tremendous time of study as we have been studying the textbook, what the Bible has to say to the believer. We have been tremendously blessed with the word of God because God has given us everything we need to live victoriously here while we are representing him in this dark and dismal world. He said, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But now that he has gone back to his father and has taken his rightful place on the right hand of the father, a place of honor, he now expects us to represent him as the light of the world. And in order for our light to shine and to shine brightly, we need to know how God wants us to conduct ourselves as we live here on planet Earth. And so what he has done is given us the word of God as a basis for our consideration to use as a roadmap so that we can stay engaged in representing him in a way that would allow us to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We thank you for your love and kindness. We thank you for your tender mercies. We thank you for being our God and the love that you demonstrated toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, we come now to say thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We thank you for all of the marvelous blessings that you have allowed us to enjoy, life and a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you for the privilege of being a part of the family of God through the St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing upon our time together. We ask that you allow your word to flow freely into our hearts that we might receive them and hide them in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. And, Father, we will be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in chapter 5 of our text and chapter 5 is entitled what God expects of you we've previously studied uh, two sections of this chapter the first section being you and the Holy Spirit how God expects your relationship with the Holy Spirit to uh, exist and then we talked about how God expects you to study his holy word and tonight we're going to deal with prayer your relationship to prayer as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's begin our study tonight by looking at John chapter 14 and verse number 13 and 14. I'll read it in the New King James Version. It says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So the first thing we want to share today is the thesis that you must pray in Jesus' name in order to receive answers to your prayers. So the question can be legitimately raised, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Well, it means far more than just mentioning Jesus' name in your prayer or simply closing your prayer with the words in Jesus' name. It means that the only person whose name is perfect enough to approach God is Jesus. When Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, Adam fell into a state of sin. And as a result of that, that same sinful condition has been passed on to the descendants of Adam. The Bible declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In fact, we were born in sin. And so as a result of that, we do not have the holy condition on our own to be able to approach a holy God. And so in order to accomplish that, we have to have a mediator. We have to have someone who we have that is on our side that allows us to use his authority or to use his righteousness or to use his right standing in order for us to approach uh, a holy God. Let me see if I can help you to understand the principle and then we'll look at it a little further in our text. Uh, some of us grew up in the hood such that we had corner stores. And back in the day, 
everybody in the community knew each other. And they were on limited incomes and they were limited in their resources. So the, the individuals who operated the corner stores would sometimes allow members of the community, families that lived near the store, to have a running account or to have a credit account uh, with the store so that they, if they needed something in between paydays, they could go to the store. He would let them have it. He just put it on that bill. And once they were paid or once their social security check came in, that they would take care of the bill. Well, sometimes mother was too busy to go to the store, and so she would send uh, the children to the store, perhaps to get a loaf of bread or to perhaps get a dozen of eggs or, or a carton of milk. And so they, she would say, well, go down to the store and ask Mr. Jones to send me a loaf of bread and put it on my bill. Now, if you as a child went in, you didn't have an account, you say, well, I want me some candy or I want me some some uh, soda pop. Well, that wouldn't work too well because you didn't have an account. You didn't have right standing. You didn't have a relationship with the owner so that you could get what you want on your word. But if you went into the store and say, Mr. Jones, my mama said, send her a loaf of bread and a dozen of eggs. Well, he would give it to you based on the fact that you are representing your mother. You came in her name. So what Jesus is allowing us to understand in this text is that we don't have right relationship with the heavenly father to approach him on our own. But if we go in his name, if we go in his name, then the father will respond. So when you approach God in the name of Jesus, you are asking God to hear you because of Christ's righteousness not because of your goodness. None of us are good enough uh, to approach God on our own because the Bible says all of our righteousness is but filthy rags. So if you want God to answer your prayers uh, to honor Christ, uh, he have to uh, understand, you have to understand that you're not going in your own name. You're going in the name of Christ. So he's honoring Christ. Uh, he's not honoring you. This is what it means to pray in Jesus' name. So when you ask Christ to hear you and you genuinely trust in his name, all he is, all he has done for you, he promises to answer your prayer. So the first principle we want to help you to understand tonight as it relates to prayer uh, for the believer is that you must pray in Jesus' name in order for your prayers to be answered. But then secondly, you ought to follow three simple rules of prayer that were laid down by Christ himself. Let me read Matthew chapter six, commencing with verse number seven. And I'll read it in the NASB version of the Bible. It says, and when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask. Now, too often people measure prayer by the fluency or the eloquency or the goodness of the sounds of the words and the length of the prayer, thinking that a long prayer implies sincerity our devotion. But Christ puts the matter very simply when he prays. He says, the rules are clear. First of all, he says, do not use meaningless or thoughtless repetition. Now, there are several things that lend themselves to meaningless repetition. First of all, let me consider uh, uh, memorized prayer. Uh, just saying the words of a form prayer, for example, the Lord's Prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying a memorized prayer, but it should be prayed through and not just repeated with no thought behind the words. It should be something that comes from the heart. Uh, so that's, that's how it ought to be. And written or well-worded prayers, uh, that should be avoided because we're thinking that what you say is so expressive and so well-worded that it is bound 
to carry weight with God. Well, the words may be descriptive and the words may be beautifully arranged, but the heart, the heart must be offering the prayer. Not the mind, not the ego, but the heart. Uh, such a prayer is empty repetition. And then consider ceremonial or ritual prayer. Uh, saying the same prayer at the same time on the same occasion over and over again, such as at weddings and funerals and meals or worship service. This can soon become meaningless repetition. And then predictable or compulsory prayer. In other words, praying in the same way on a, on a rigid schedule can lead to praying strictly as a habit, uh, a repeated practice with little or no meaning at all. And then thoughtless prayer, speaking words while your mind is wandering. You're praying, but your mind is wandering somewhere else. When this happens, you need to ask God to forgive you and immediately begin to focus your mind on him. No one can control your thoughts but you. It is up to you to concentrate on what you are praying about. Then here's one that's a good one. Religious terms or phrases. Using certain words or phrases over and over again in prayer because they sound religious or they sound pious. For example, the repeated use of mercy, grace. I thank thee, O oh God, dear Lord, I pray. You know, those things that we we have picked up because we've heard others saying, we think that makes us sound so spiritual. It makes us sound so religious. And then habitual references to God, using repetition, mindlessness, such as Lord this, Lord that, God this, God that, Jesus this, Jesus that. This shows that a person is giving very little thought to what he or she is praying about. Far too little fear and reverence are seen when approaching him whose name is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Now let me be kind of clear here. Christ is not saying that repetition in prayer is wrong. Let me repeat that because I don't want to confuse anyone and allow you to run off with the wrong idea. He's not saying that repetition in prayer is wrong. It is not wrong. What is wrong is vain and empty repetition. Christ himself used repetition in prayer. In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 44, it'll tell you, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And that was when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And of course, Daniel did as well. In Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 18, he says, O oh my God, incline thine ear, and hear open thine eyes, and behold our desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And then the psalmist in Psalm 136 and verse 1. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. There are several basic things that will keep you from using meaningless repetition in prayer. So let's look at those several basic things that will keep you from using meaningless repetition in prayer. First of all, you need a genuine heart, knowing God personally and having a moment-by-moment -moment fellowship with him all the day long. That's a genuine heart. And then you need concentrated thought, really focusing on what you're saying. Don't just say one thing and your mind is flowing somewhere else, but you need a concentrated thought. And then there is a need for desire, for fellowship with God. 
praying sincerely, opening uh, your heart to him so that you can be openly and personally uh, reflecting your thoughts uh, with God. And then preparation, preparation. When possible, calm your spirit and prepare to meet God by first meditating on his word. If you had an important invitation with someone that you respected highly, you would not just go in unprepared, but you would make sure you were prepared from a perspective of being groomed properly. You would make sure you were prepared from the perspective of having your thoughts in mind as to what you're going to say. You might even have some notes that can keep you on target because you recognize that appointment is important to you and perhaps the individual that you're meeting with has a short time frame. So then you have to make sure you focus on what it is you're meeting about. So then preparation, make sure you give God what he so rightfully deserve, your undivided attention. And so he says, secondly, do not speak much. And what he means by that is that some believers think that the length of prayer equals devotion. That is, the longer they pray, the more God will listen to them and the more spiritually they will become. They feel that long prayers show how sincere they are. God does not hear your prayer because it is long, but he hears your prayer because it is genuinely poured out to him. Length has nothing to do with devotion, but sincerity of heart does have something to do with devotion. Long prayers are certainly not forbidden. Let me be clear about that. Uh, what is forbidden is thinking that long prayers are automatically heard by God. For example, Christ prayed all night long. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, we see this verse that says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So we're not saying that you are not to pray long, but we are not to pray long from a quote-unquote repetitious, ritualistic, uh, meaningless perspective, but in sincerity. Now, the early disciples prayed and fasted and sought God for 10 days and nights, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. You remember in Acts chapter 2, when the, on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in the upper room. They had been praying for 10 days, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So obviously there are special times when an extended prayer time is necessary. Some of these times are clearly seen in scripture. For example, sometimes you should sense the need of the world so much that you're driven to seek God and his intervention for long periods of time and seeking should be often, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So that sometimes you sense the need of the world and you are driven to seek God for his intervention. And then sometimes a very special pull to praise and adore God arises within your heart. You have this unction that you just feel the need to spend some time with God in prayer. And so when you feel this pull, you should get alone and spend a very special time praising and worshiping God. Uh, that happened in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. You recall Paul and Silas was in jail. And the Bible says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So sometimes you just feel this urge. And listen, this urge don't wait till Sunday morning. This urge can hit you uh, any time. It can be while you're riding along in your car. Uh, it can be while you're sitting alone in your living room, and you just have this urge to praise and, and worship God alone. And then sometimes a special need will arise in your life. This may be your own need or the need of a friend or the need of a loved one. You should intercede until God gives you the assurance that the need will be met. Again, you see that in Acts uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, 
verse 18, but also you see it in Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 particularly, where it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So you recall in the book of Acts, we're preaching through the book of Acts on Sunday morning, Peter and John were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. Well, they were thrown in jail, and while they were in jail, the saints were praying for them without ceasing until God answered their prayer. In fact, if you read that passage of scripture, you'll see while they were praying, God had already released Peter, and he was knocking on the door. And they sent someone to, to see who was at the door, and they didn't believe their eyes. Uh, God had already answered their prayers while they were praying. And then sometimes an unusual experience or event has taken place or is about to take place in either your own life or in the life of a loved one. And you should get alone and share the event with God. And you should stay before God until you receive what is needed to face the matter. Whether it's courage, whether it's, it's confidence, whether it is power, or whether it is faith, love or assurance. God will give you what you need. Sometimes we're praying an intercessory prayer on behalf of others. In this day and time in which we are impacted with the, the coronavirus, uh, at one point it was something that was happening afar off. When it began, it began in, in another country. And now it is spreading throughout these United States, even to the point of impacting people in our own families, uh, people who are colleagues of ours, who we know personally. And so what we're doing is we're praying constantly for God to intervene in this situation. That's an example. And then sometimes a great trial or temptation is confronting you. A long session of prayer may be needed to gain strength and keep you away from the trial or, or the temptation. And sometimes, you may need to work through a particular problem or a difficult circumstance or make a major decision. In these times, you need to seek help and guidance from God. God should be acknowledged in all of your ways. That's what the Bible says. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You should continue to ask God for help until the answer comes. And there are Many examples in scripture that helps you to understand that to be the case. So in concluding this point, always remember that prayer is a matter of the heart. Not a matter of words, not a matter of length of prayer. Praying is sharing with God your thoughts, your feeling, your praises, and your requests. As if you were speaking with him face to face. Then the third thing is that you, when you pray... You need to trust God. Now, understand, God knows what you need even before you ask. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. And then in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24, it says, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. So why then should we pray if God already knows what we need before we ask? The question is legitimately raised. Why? Should we pray? Well, i tell you why. Because prayer demonstrates your need for God and your dependence upon him. Prayers give time for consecrated sharing and communion between you and God. It's an opportunity for you to spend some quality personal time with God. Now, it's not enough merely to have knowledge of God in your mind. As you walk throughout life, you need to have time when you are in the presence of God and can concentrate your thoughts and prayer and fellowship with God. 
You need such time with God just as you need such time with your family and friends. You know how it is and you have family members. If you're not a single individual, if you're married, that spouse want you to spend some quality time with her, even to the point of the, some couples have what they call a designated date night because the, the wife is working, the husband is working, they're being pulled apart with so many responsibilities of life that they don't just take it for granted that they will have quality time uh, without it being scheduled, about it being particularly planned. So they have what they call a date night so that they can have quality time. Well, God wants some quality time with you. And so when you pray, uh, you trust God to the point that you want to spend some quality time with him. So you need that time with God, just like you need it with your family and your friends. Now, you're not meant to live in isolation f from people, nor are you meant to live in isolation from God. So therefore, pray not only to have your needs met, but pray to share fellowship and enrich your life with God. Always keep in mind that God desires to fellowship with you, and he wants to do it very often. He wants to hear from you, but he also wants you to hear from him. He wants to meet you at your point of need. So just pray and trust him, for he loves you. He cares for you. As a matter of fact, let me read 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 7. He says, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. So then God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray. And we need to follow these simple rules uh, laid down for prayer. And that is, uh, do not uh, speak vain words and repetition. Uh, do not speak much. Not necessary to do that. Uh, just out of ritualistic. And then when you pray, trust God. But then you need to persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. That's found in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. But let me just summarize it with this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. That's Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. So you need to persevere in prayer. In other words, ask, seek, and knock. Now, what is a persevering prayer? What is a persevering prayer? It is asking, seeking, and knocking until the answer is received or that till the answer is is found until the door is opened. It is being so passionate or fervent about something that you never give up until God responds. Now the words ask, seek, and knock are in the present tense in the passage. You ought to keep on asking. You ought to keep on seeking. You ought to keep on knocking. You ought to persist in prayer. Now the word receive Fine and open are also in the present tense. So this shows that the answer to prayer is more than just a promise for the future. Perhaps the events has not yet happened, nor the problem resolved, nor the answer received. But by faith, you know that God has heard your prayer. Christ teaches several important lessons about prayer in these two verses. First of all, he teaches that true prayer is persevering prayer. When you cease, when you seek, you have to continue seeking. You sense a real need to pray. And when you sense a real need to pray, you should not only ask, but also seek and knock. Do not play around and murmur a prayer, but pray and continue to pray until you receive an answer. And then he allows us to understand that prayer is to be often. Christ tells you to ask, to seek, to knock, which means pray repeatedly, pray often, and pray intensely. 
And then the answer to your prayers are assured. In verses 9 and 10 of this chapter, he says, oh, What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? God is not reluctant to give us what we need. It's not necessary for you to keep knocking because God is reluctant to give you what you need. Uh, he is not sending back disinterested and unconcerned about your welfare. He is a loving father who cares deeply for his child. God will never refuse to hear your request. The request of his dear child is important to him. Uh, he will respond to your prayers. And then the request uh, should be the thing wanted. However, you must always understand that what is wanted need to be in God's will in order for it to be answered. You must not ask for selfish desires and motives. God gives only what is good and wholesome for you. And he's not going to give you something that's not good for you. Now look at 1 John chapter 5. Uh, verses 14 and 15, he says, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so it is important for us to understand that what we request, the thing we request, need to be in the will of God. Let me look at James chapter 1, verse 17. It says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Now, Anytime you have something that is real, nine times out of ten, there is a possibility of having a counterfeit or having what we call a knockoff. In other words, just because we have every good and perfect gift coming down from above does not negate the fact that we have an enemy, the adversary, the devil that has the ability to dress something up and make it look like it's coming from God, but it is coming from the pits of hell itself. And so God doesn't give you something that's going to bring a curse on your life. Whatever God gives you is going to bring a blessing to you. So he says every good and perfect gift comes from above. So make sure what you're praying for is in the will of God. And then James chapter 4 verse 2, he says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. So make sure what you're asking is something that is in the will of God. And then he allows us to understand that true prayer, persevering prayer, acknowledges your dependence upon God. It is when you face a desperate need that you're stirred to cry out to God, that you really begin to ask, to seek, and to knock. The very fact that you keep on asking, that you keep on seeking, that you keep on knocking, demonstrates that you are truly dependent upon God. That's what the, the hymnologist was talking about. Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go. Sometimes there are situations in your life that only God can get you through. Your visa can't help you. Your American Express can't help you. Your mama can't help you. Your daddy can't help you. Your political connections can't help you. The only person that you can depend on to get you out of some situations is God Almighty. And those are the times when you don't have a problem asking, seeking, and knocking, waiting for God to respond to your request. Now, this is an important point here. God does not always answer your prayers immediately. Let me say that again. God does not 
always answer your prayers immediately. People frequently wonder why it is necessary to ask to seek and to knock and to keep on asking, to keep on seeking and to keep on knocking. Well, there are at least four reasons for that. First of all, prayer teaches you to communicate and fellowship with God and to seek him more and more. In other words, if God gave you what you wanted just like that, you probably get it and go on about your business and forget about God. But sometimes God allows the delay uh, to the answer to your prayer so that you can pray about it, then you can pray about it again, then you can pray about it again. And what you're doing is you're spending time with him. You are spending quality time because you are communicating, you're fellowshipping with him. So prayer teaches you to communicate and to fellowship with him and to seek him more and more. But not only that, prayer teaches you to be patient and to hope in God and his promises more and more. Uh, it teaches you patience. You know, sometimes when our children have made requests of us and sometimes we can respond immediately, but sometimes we don't respond immediately because we're teaching them patience. We're teaching them that the world doesn't revolve around them. Sometimes it is necessary for you to do some things and sometimes it's necessary for you to wait for the right timing. For example, they may want a dessert. Well, you're going to give them the dessert, but the dessert don't come before dinner. The dessert comes after dinner. So then what you do is you teach them to have patience until the timing is right. And so sometimes when we're praying to God, he's teaching us to be patient and to hope in him. When God does not answer your prayer immediately, you should continue coming into his presence, waiting and hoping for what he has promised that will happen. You recall God promised Abraham that he would be a father of many. And of course, Abraham went through uh, his, his young adult life. He did not have any children. He went through middle-aged life. He did not have any children. And finally, when he reached old age, that's when God promised a uh, son came into existence. And so sometimes God allows us to go through a waiting period. It teaches us patience. It gives us an opportunity to hope in what he has promised to us. So you can actually grow more mature in patience and endurance as you learn to place more hope in God and his wonderful promises. Now, during this waiting stage, you need to fight off the urge to take matters into your own hands and to prematurely try to resolve uh, your situation without divine guidance because that's what happened in the life of Abraham when he was waiting for the sun and the son had not arrived and his wife suggested that he would go into his, her handmaiden and have a son. And that was not God's design and that caused some issues. So sometimes when we take matters into our own hands, we mess situations up that God have to come behind us and, and clean up. And so we have, have to learn how to continue to place our hope in God and his wonderful promises. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we need to learn how to have patience and wait on him and continue to pray and allow him to uh, uh, fulfill his promises to us at his own appointed time. Then prayer teaches you to love God as your father more and more. Knowing that God is going to answer your prayer and having to wait on the answer causes you to draw closer to him. I know there have been times in your life when uh, your children have had desires that they wanted to ask uh, of you. And many times when they have those desires uh, uh, of you, they'll spend more time with you. They'll, 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 they'll pour some affection on you. Uh, they'll be extra nice to you. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be extra responsive. And sometimes in the back of your mind, you're saying, oh, what do you want now? I know it's something. Well, when we're spending that kind of time with God, it gives us an opportunity to, to express our love for him, to express our, our appreciation to him. We're spending quality time because we are being responsive to him as he is uh, preparing us to receive the blessing 
that he has promised to us. And then the prayer, when the prayer is answered, your heart is endeared to him even the more. You're so thankful to him when he responds to your prayer. Uh, prayer also demonstrates how deeply you trust God, how much you love and depend on him. As you grow in that trust, you will bring more and more concerns to God. There have been times in my life when I've had situations that God has worked out. Now, one of the things that I've learned over the years in my relationship with God is that Satan is always going to be on his job. Uh, there was this lady that was a member of the church uh, some years ago. The story is told. Uh, she always had something nice to say about everybody. I mean, she had something. It, it could be the, the worst person in the neighborhood, but she always had something nice to say about everybody. So they tried to trip her up one day, and they say, so Sally, what do you think about the devil? She said, one thing about that old devil, he's always on his job. And you know that's the truth. The devil is always on his job. He's always going to try uh, to draw you away from God. He's always going to try to attract your attention away from where it needs to be. So when you're praying, you're demonstrating how deeply you trust God and how deeply you depend on him. And as you grow in that trust, you will bring more concerns to him. So when God has demonstrated his ability to handle situations in your life, when other situations pop up, you don't become so despondent and, 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 and hopeless and helpless until you're ready to throw in the towel. But what you can do as a result of your experience with God is you can, okay, God, I'm just going to sit back and see how you're going to work this one out because you work other situations out. And if you did it before, you have the ability to do it again. So I'm just going to trust in you. I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to depend on you to bring me out of this situation. So when you're praying about something, it allows you to have enough confidence in God that you bring more concerns to God. If, on the other hand, you're not quite sure that God will answer your prayer, uh, you will only occasionally come to him, usually in emergencies. But when you just have confidence that God will answer your prayer, you go to him all the time. You pray about this, you pray about that, knowing that God has the ability to do what he says. Your prayer life is easily uh, showing just how much you depend on him and how much you trust him. And so for these reasons, we should be more encouraged to persevere in prayer. We've got to learn how to ask. We've got to learn how to seek. And we've got to learn how to knock. And then you should not be anxious about anything, but pray. Tell God, and what will happen? This is what will happen. And the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. Let me read Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6 and 7. I'm going to read it in the New American Standard Version. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, and the King James Version says, all understanding, will guard your heart's and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this is actually a charge. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry about anything. Do not allow anything to upset your apple cart to the point that you can't function. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, the idea is that you are not to worry or you are not to fret about a single thing. Now, this is more easily said than done. Uh, well, most of us suffer some degree of anxiety. For example, when we lose money or when we lose our employment or when we lose a friendship or when we lose a loved one or anything of value to us, we have a tendency to be anxious about it. Uh, it's human nature. Uh, when we lack or unable to provide adequate food, clothing, and shelter, by human nature, we would become anxious about that. We perhaps would worry about that. Or when we live in an environment, whether it's a work environment or worship environment or a divisive or stressful environment, that's giving you uh, cause for anxiety. 
Oh, oh, when you're persecuted, when you're ridiculed, or when you're abused or threatened, there is possibility for anxiety there. I share with you a situation that happened to me uh, just this past Saturday. I, I presided over a homegoing celebration. Of course, usually when I start the service, I will say we will follow the program that has been presented to us by the family. And unless I get uh, instructions from the family to deviate from the program, typically I will follow the program. Well, in this particular service, there were people that were wanting to pop up and to do stuff that was not on the program. The program calls for reflections for two minutes. Didn't call for you to get up and sing a song and then preach a sermon or, or do something that's not necessarily requested of the family. So by virtue of the fact that I was officiating, I said, I'm sorry, we're going to stick to the program. Uh, please comply with the family's request. Well, this individual obviously was so upset with that until when we got to the cemetery, he was calling me everything but a child of God. But you know what? God gave me a sense of peace. He gave me a sense of, 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 of comfort, knowing that even though I was being ridiculed and abused and even threatened, that he did not allow me to become anxious. I was able to carry out the function according to uh, the responsibility of my pastoral uh, responsibilities. So when you have that kind of relationship with God, when you are uh, prayerful, he will give you what is necessary. He will guard your heart. And so when we face serious illnesses or other problems, he gives you that sense of peace that guards you from the anxiety. I recall when I had to to go in uh, for catheterization because of some heart issues. I didn't know what the situation was, but I say, whatever it is, uh, just go ahead and, and take care of it. I didn't get anxious about it because I had turned it over to the master. And now here I am 10 years later, still going strong for the master. So he gives you a sense of peace. So when situations arise, you look back over your life and see how God has brought you through those particular circumstances. And then you remind yourself. Sometimes you just have to encourage yourself. Sometimes you look in the mirror and remind yourself of what God has already done in your life. And recognize that he had the power to bring you through again. So in the midst of such circumstances, we do not have the ability or power within ourselves to keep us from worrying. No, I'm not saying I was not worrying because of the power that was in myself. No, I wasn't packing Saturday at the funeral, so if something had jumped off, I would just would have been in the, uh, the hands of those who would perhaps step in or call law enforcement officials. No, I didn't have a crystal ball that said if I had to go into surgery that everything was going to be fine. But what happens is in the midst of circumstances, you don't have the ability to keep yourself from worrying. The only way that you can keep from being apprehensive or frightened is to receive an injection of supernatural power. That supernatural power. Well, how do you get that? According to the word of God, Worry and anxiety uh, is something that comes on us as a result of our human nature and as a result of the work of the enemy. But the supernatural answer uh, to, to the anxiety and worry is the peace of God. And so as a true believer, God will enable you to conquer your fear. God will enable you to conquer your uneasiness. God will empower you to overcome and walk through the trials of life, no matter how terrible and pressing they may be. God will infuse you with peace, the very peace of God himself, a peace that is so amazing that it carries you right through the trial. You, you get through it and you look back and, and, and the song says, my soul looks back and wonder how I got over. Of course, this does not mean that you're not to be concerned about the problems of life, but that you will not bear some suffering because that is not the case. You will have problems. You will have some suffering. You ought to be concerned to the extent that you will experience some suffering and pain in life, but through it all, God promises to give you peace of heart and peace of mind. Now, here is the remedy to anxiety and worry. It's right there 
in verse 6. He says, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. This means that you ought to walk around in the spirit of prayer, that you ought to pray about everything as you go through your daily affairs. Uh, furthermore, you ought to pray about every single thing, no matter how small or how insignificant it may seem. God is interested in the details of your life, in the most minute details. He, he wants you to acknowledge him in all of your ways because he cares about you. And he wants to look after you in everything that you do. Picture the scene. You're walking through your day, sharing with God every step of the way, and God is right there with you. What then can take away the peace of God? You're walking through the day, going through your daily activities, but God is there with you. That ought to give you a sense of peace. Absolutely nothing can take your peace when you come to the realization of the fact that you're not alone. Jesus promised never to leave us or forsake us. He's right there with us. So for as you walk in prayer and fellowship with God, God is infusing you with his presence and peace. When you're praying about it, he's infusing you with his presence. He's reminding you that you're not there in that situation alone. And as a result of that, he's giving you his supernatural peace. No matter the conflict, no matter the trial, he's there for you and with you. You're communing with God and he's continuing to strengthen you with his presence. How does he do that? You do that through prayer. He's giving you the peace to conquer and to walk through the trial. Your relationship with God and his peace is unbroken when you're in a consistent attitude of prayer. And so the remedy for anxiety is prayer. And then God's great promise is also a peace, a peace of heart and a peace of mind. Right there in verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, to be at peace means to be assured. To be at peace means to be confident. To be at peace means to be secure in love and in care of God. In other words, it means to have a sense of consciousness, a knowledge that God will take care of you. Know what God says about the peace he gives. First, God's peace passes all understanding. It is beyond anything that you can ask or think. It even surpasses all that you can imagine. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Envision the most terrible thing you would ever have to face or endure. Think of the peace that you would need as you went through that trial. And in all reality, the peace of God is far greater than anything you could understand or hope. Uh, the peace of God actually carries a faithful believer through the midst of the most devastating trials and temptation. There have been times in my life when I faced uh, situations of uncertainty. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I won't go into the details, but when I have situations that I uh, face, sometimes before I get into the situation, uh, I anticipate what the worst case scenario would be. And after anticipating the worst case scenario would be, then in my mind, I figure out how it is uh, God can handle even the worst case scenario. And then once I get to that, then I, I have a sense of peace. And anything that happens all the way up to the worst case scenario or less than the worst case scenario, God has already uh, had the ability to work it out because I base it on what he's done previously in my life. And so when he's taking you through some trials and tribulations, when he's taking you through some pains and sufferings, for example, if you've been in the hospital before and God brought you out, if you got to go to the hospital again, you just concentrate on the fact that he brought you out before. He can do it again. 
If you've lost a job and God gave you another job that was better than the job you lost, well, if you lose this job, just remember the fact that the same God that gave you this job when you lost that job is the same God that can give you another job. And even in the midst of that, you didn't miss any meals. You didn't get put outdoors. You still had a roof over your head. You still have clothes on your back. Even though you were unemployed, God took care of you during that drought. So what you do is you remember what God has already done, and it gives you a sense of peace to know that he will take care of you in the midst of your problematic situation. So the peace of God actually carries the faithful believer through the midst of the most devastating trials and temptations. But then secondly, the peace of God guards your heart and your mind. In other words, the word guard is a military term, meaning to garrison, to keep watch, and to protect. The peace of God is like an elite soldier who guards and protects God's most precious possessions. You are one of God's most precious possessions. And so God allows his peace to guard your heart and your mind because you are a child of God. So it is imperative to remember, however, that God can keep you. God can watch over you. God can protect you only if you are in Christ Jesus. There is the key. The peace of God is found only in Christ Jesus. God cannot look upon sin, as I indicated earlier in this message. We are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity, such that we cannot have fellowship with God without having a mediator. When God looks over the balances of glory, those of us who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have been covered by the blood of Jesus. So he don't see all that we've done. He sees the finished work of Christ on Calvary, having paid the penalty for our sins. And so he puts us in right relationship with him because we're not going before God with our own righteousness, but rather we're going before God clothed in the righteousness of his son through the work of his son on Calvary's cross. So this means that we can know the peace of God only if we've trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior and that we're covered in his righteousness. Only if you walk in prayer and fellowship with him does it mean that you can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world give do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things I've spoken that you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulations, but be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then you should set aside a time for prayer, both prayer and fasting, when a special need arises. Fasting means to abstain from food, particularly for a cause. Now, from a worldly perspective, fasting is rarely undertaken except to protest something or to call attention to something. For example, we remember uh, a civil rights icon by the name of Dick Gregory. Uh, one of his methodologies for protesting was to go on fast. It was to draw attention to what he was protesting about. But when you come to spiritual fasting, it is just the opposite. Through fasting is usually a deep personal experience, a time set aside uh, from food to seek God's guidance and God's direction in your life. And this word fasting means to abstain. Now, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to fast. The wrong way fasting is, is when we are doing it to gain the approval uh, of self, self-approval, uh, uh, to fulfill a religious ritual or <clears throat> to, to, to gain religious recognition or to genuinely uh, seek after the approval of other individuals. That's the wrong way to do it. And Jesus condemned that type. Uh, uh, when we do those types of fasting, you have the danger of becoming, uh, how should I put this? Uh, feeling like you're super spiritual. You know, that reminds me of, of Peter when he, he said to Jesus, when Jesus told him he was going to be arrested and he was going to be crucified. 
Peter said, oh, no, I would not let that happen. He was being super spiritual. He, he's so powerful. But then what happened, uh, when it got down to the bottom line, that same Peter, because he was relying on his own strength, he did not even know the Lord. And so that, that's a danger of overconfidence, a danger of revealing your fasting experience. And sometimes you want to be looked at at the world so you let everybody know that uh, you're fasting. And so there's a danger of changing your appearance and got a frown on your face and uh, everybody know you, you're fasting. But that's not how, that's the wrong way to do it. But the right way to fast is it should be, be done so that it is not done in the presence of people, but it is done in the presence of God. It's something between you and God, you and God alone. And what you do in secret, God will reward you openly. So it is important for you to understand that when you're talking about fair, uh, prayer and fasting, there's several excellent benefits to fasting. And you want to reap these benefits. First of all, fasting keeps you in the presence of God. Uh, fasting humbles your soul before God. Fasting teaches you to depend more and more upon God. Fasting demonstrates to God by action a real seriousness. Listen, when you turn your plate down, and some of us know we love to eat, but when we turn our plate down and go before God, it's letting God know just how serious we are about what we are fasting and praying about. Fasting teaches you to control and discipline your life. Fasting keeps you from being enslaved by habit. So you lay aside all the substance that you would normally engage in when you're going through fasting. So it is important for you to understand that prayer and fasting. Jesus said on one occasion, these things go out only by fasting and prayer. And so sometimes it is necessary for us to put some fasting along with our prayer. So there it is. We are encouraged to, to have a strong prayer life. Uh, someone has said, little prayer, little power, much prayer, much power. I pray that this lesson has been helpful to you, those of you that have uh, been with us uh, doing this series of studies. We are helping you to understand that God has described in his word uh, how we are to conduct our lives in every aspect. And so tonight we've dealt with prayer uh, specifically. So next week we'll deal with uh, a new topic. And so we ask you to continue to work with us. I think we're going to be looking at our faith on next week. So we encourage you to continue to follow along with us. We're not on a particular time schedule. We're spending enough time so that we can allow the word of God to be absorbed into your spirit and thereby can be hidden in your heart so that you can grow in grace and the knowledge of him. Well, at this time, we want to extend an invitation to the open door of the church to give someone an opportunity to accept the Lord Jesus Christ into their hearts as their personal savior. You don't have to be in a sanctuary wherever you are whether you're in your family room, whether you're in your kitchen, or whether you are riding along in your car listening to us on your phone, whatever uh, situation you're in, there's no geographical limitations to the power of God. The power of God can reach you wherever you are to embrace you and to bring you into the family of God. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and that God raised him from the dead on the third day. The Bible declares you're saved. Would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of acknowledging our sinful condition and acknowledging the fact that we don't have the power to save ourselves. And we ask now that Jesus would come into our hearts and be our personal Savior. We believe that he is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, and that you raised him from the dead on the third day. We believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. That being the case, we declare that we're saved and we thank you for saving us. We pray God's blessings upon you. If you prayed that prayer, please contact our office and let us know that you accepted Christ as your Savior and you would like to become a part of the family of God through the St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church. You can reach us at area code 813-247-2345. We would be most delighted to reach out to you and to give you some information that will help you to begin your Christian journey. But we'll also be in a position to minister to you virtually until such time 
that we come together physically. Well, God bless you and keep you is our prayer. It's giving time. We're going to give now an opportunity for the members of the St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church to join us in continuing to support our church. And we pray God's blessings upon your finances. As God bless you, you're in a position to bless the church financially. We thank you so much for what you've done in keeping our church doors open and operating virtually. And if there are members of the community that would like to share with us, please feel free to do so as well, knowing that the gifts that you give to us will be used for the purpose in which it was given, and that is for the upbuilding of God's kingdom. We are so grateful to all those who contribute to our ministry. Your faithful giving is important as we continue to advance the kingdom of God around the globe. Here at St. John, we offer the option of online giving where your tithes and offerings and donations are securely done through our website. Simply log on to stjohnprogressive.org Click on the online giving button and follow the prompts. For assistance, call our church office at 813-247-2345. We also have the other option of mail-in tithes and offerings. Mail your donations to St. John Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, P.O. Box 75194, Tampa, Florida, 336. Seven, five. Your donations are needed now more than ever, and they are the lifeline of this church. The Bible tells us in Malachi 3 and 10 to bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that you shall not have room enough to receive it. Thank you so much in advance for your support. And now, back to my dad, Pastor Banks. Well, thank you so very much for being a part of our Bible study tonight. We pray God's blessings upon you and your family. We are looking forward to God continuing to bless us, sustain us, and keep us together virtually as we go through this pandemic season. We will continue to be mindful of the situation of the virus still being active in our community. So we will continue to exercise social distancing. We'll continue to wear our masks. We'll continue to sanitize our hands so that we will mitigate spreading of the virus to the best of our ability. So that being said, we will continue to do our virtual worship as well as our virtual Bible studies for, uh, for the very uh, near future. We'll let you know if things change. We will be celebrating our communion service on Sunday. Those of you that do not have your elements, please stop by the church uh, between the hours of 9 and 6 on Thursday, and if you are not able to come by the church, just go ahead and use some crackers and juice that you have at home, and we will consecrate it for service on Sunday. Our Zooms continue on Mondays at 6.30, and our prayer calls continue on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.30. Please remember to share uh, our, our virtual services on Facebook, with your friends, uh, start a watch party, uh, let them know that they can uh, access our services via Zoom uh, on Monday nights with our young people, or they can access our streaming via Facebook or YouTube. Uh, just visit our website and get the information that will help you to connect with us. God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Uh, again, we continue to pray for the, the Lewis family as well as uh, the Vivian family as we lay to rest one of the icons of our civil rights movement. Uh, and we pray that God will continue to raise up other voices that can be used to bring about positive change in our communities. 
And as part of our, our worship service, each week we will show a video uh, produced by our social justice ministry that will help us to understand the importance of allowing our voices to be heard through the vote. So please be patient as we share that information with you from time to time. God bless you and keep you as I pray. Let's close. Gracious God, our Father, how we bless your name for the privilege of studying your word together. We pray that your word will be hidden in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Bless your people everywhere. Continue to provide our needs according to your riches and glory. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us henceforth and forever. Let us all say amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Deacon Samuel Kinsey. I take this opportunity to thank all who are out there on the front line advocating for equal rights and equal justice under the law for African American people. This is also a good time to pay tribute to all the heroes of decades past who fought oftentimes at great peril to themselves for African Americans to have the right to vote. In just a short time, we will elect the President of the United States and a number of other federal officials. But many decisions that impact our daily lives are made by elected officials at the state and local levels or the people they hire or appoint to various positions. Consequently, all elections, federal, state, and local, are important. Elections determine whether our country is respected and will be a world leader, both diplomatically and militarily. 
They determine the quality of our children's education or whether there will be good paying jobs that enable us to support our families, afford decent housing, send our children to college, and have good health insurance. Elections determine the amount we pay in taxes and the services we receive in our communities. They determine who heads our law enforcement agencies and whether or not we will live in safe communities and are treated with respect and dignity by those in authority. Elections determine whether felons who have paid their debt to society will have their rights restored, and they determine whether or not there will be a safety net for the needy. We at St. John take voting seriously, and we encourage all to register and never, ever miss an opportunity to vote. If you have any questions about your eligibility to vote, when and where to vote, or how to register to vote, please call or visit the website of the Supervisor of Elections in the county where you live. Remember, go out and vote. We're counting on you. Be blessed and stay safe. Thank you.